Welcome back, everybody. In this video, we're starting section 9.2, which is about uh, working with two means uh, and independent samples. So uh, we're going to use data from two independent samples to test hypotheses and also make up confidence intervals uh, for uh, the difference between means. Uh, we're going to focus in this section on the more realistic case where we don't actually know the population standard deviations, although we'll see how to deal with it in the rare event that we actually do. But realistically, um, we don't actually know what the population standard deviations are, and so we'll uh, deal with that case uh, most often. All right, so a couple of definitions to start with. Um, uh, we need to differentiate between independent and dependent samples. In this section, 9.2, we're going to be working with independent samples. In independent samples, uh, the values from one population are not related to or somehow naturally paired or matched with the sample values from the other population. In contrast, uh, two samples are dependent or consist of what's called matched pairs if the sample values are somehow matched where the matching is based on some inherent relationship. Okay, uh, examples of dependent data would be uh, if we compare the cholesterol levels in husband and wife pairs, or if we were going to um, give you a proficiency test in some skill, and then uh, you go through a training and then retake that proficiency test, and we compare your before and after scores to see how effective the training was. Uh, of course, your before and after scores are paired because you're the same individual and uh, the husband and wife's uh, cholesterol levels, they, uh, we can assume that they probably eat similarly and so um, they're paired uh, because they're husband and wife. Uh, examples of uh, independent uh, samples would be uh, if we took five of you from this statistics class uh, chosen at random and then five of you from some other statistics class chosen at random and compared your final exam scores. Okay, so those are two independent samples. Um, if we were to pick out one of you from the five chosen from this class, um, we would have not paired you with uh, one of those five people from the other statistics class. So there's no natural per, uh, pairing occurring there. So this section 9.2, uh, we're going to deal with a situation where the uh, two samples are not paired. That is, they're just two independent samples. Okay, I did want to mention also that this is yet another use of this word independent and dependent, which of course, you know, that has a meaning in uh, algebra when you study systems of equations. And we saw it in uh, probability in chapter four, where we're talking about uh, events being independent or dependent. This is the same word applied to something else altogether, okay? Uh, here we have two samples. They're independent if the sample values are not paired somehow and dependent if they are paired somehow. Okay, so first thing to do is to decide, uh, do some examples where we decide which of the following involve independent or dependent samples. Okay, so in A, it says to test the effectiveness of the Atkins diet, 36 randomly selected subjects are weighed before the diet and six months after treatment with the diet. The two samples consist of the before and after weights. So think about that for a second. If you had these two lists of weight, these weights, the before weights and after weights, does it make sense that they are paired? Uh, I think it's, um, yes, they are paired. Uh, one individual uh, has a before and after weight and those uh, data values are paired within the data set. Okay, so does that make them independent or dependent? Okay, it's gonna make them dependent. Okay, so let's go ahead and write it out. So that's dependent. All right, to determine whether smoking affects memory, sorry, that keeps happening, dependent. Okay, to, to determine whether smoking affects memory, 50, 50 randomly selected smokers are given a test of word recall, and 50 randomly selected non-smokers are given the same test. Sample data consists of the scores uh, between the two groups. All right, so we want to decide are these data values paired or not? So you can picture, okay, let's say we have the list of 50 smokers and the list of 50 non-smokers. If we pick that one of the data values, is it matched in some way with a specific, uh, let's say we picked out one of the smokers values, is it paired or matched in some way with uh, one of the non-smokers values? And the answer there is no. 
So those are independent. Okay, IQ scores are obtained from a random sample of 75 wives and IQ scores are obtained from their husbands. So we have IQ scores basically from husband and wife pairs uh, 75 times. And so we want to decide if they're independent or dependent. Um, so they're paired um, because the people are paired. Uh, and so this is going to be dependent. Okay. Uh, annual incomes are obtained from a random sample of 1,200 Alaska and Hawaii residents. So those residents in the two areas are not paired in some way, uh, so those are independent. Okay, scores from a standardized test, or a standard test of math reasoning are obtained from a random sample of statistics students and another random sample of uh, sociology students. So uh, again, that's two groups and they're not paired off in any, in any particular way, so that would be independent. All right, so these will be the, uh, the independent ones are the kinds of uh, situations we're going to be working with uh, in this section. All right, so the next task we're going to do is figure out how to do a hypothesis test about a claim involving uh, the difference, uh, essentially the difference between two uh, population means. So going back to the prior page where we have the incomes of 1,200 people in Hawaii and Alaska, we could say, okay, well, based on these two samples of 1,200, that the uh, incomes of Hawaii residents are lower than the incomes of Alaska residents, or maybe they're higher. Okay, so uh, we might make that sort of a claim and test it. That's going to be the first task. Uh, the next thing will be we're going to construct a confidence interval about the difference between those two population means. Okay, so uh, let's start. So first of all, with some notations or definitions, um, mu1 will be the population mean for the first population. Sigma1 is the first population standard deviation. And n1, you can guess that's the size of the first sample. And then X bar one is the first samples mean, and then S one is the first samples standard deviation. So all of this stuff is about the first sample taken from the first population. If you replace all those ones with twos, then you get the corresponding values for the second sample and second population. Okay, in this procedure that we're looking at, uh, the, we don't know anything about sigma one and sigma two. We don't know the population standard deviation for either population, they're unknown. And so since we don't know those standard deviations, uh, we're going to use T for this procedure. So you wanna get out your T table. And we're also not assuming that we're equal. We'll see later in this section, a process we can follow where I uh, suppose we do know, or we don't know the population standard deviations, but somehow we know they're the same, even though we don't know them, uh, there's a procedure for that. This one though, we don't know anything basically about the um, sigmas. And so this is the kind of most general uh, situation. Okay, uh, a couple things we do require though is that the two samples be independent. Okay. And they're going to be uh, taken from simple random samples. Uh, the two samples are both large. That is uh, N1 and N2 are both bigger than 30 or both samples come from populations that are normally distributed. So we're going to either need big samples, samples of size uh, 30 or more, or bigger than 30, uh, or the populations have to be normal. Okay, and then uh, the fine print here, the methods used here are robust against departures from normality. So for small samples, the normality requirement is loose in the sense that the procedures will perform well as long as there are no outliers and as long as the departures from normality are not too, too extreme. But basically the sample sizes need to be bigger than 30 uh, or uh, the populations need to be normal. Okay, so um, our null hypothesis uh, for these uh, hypothesis tests are going to be that the two population means are the same. That is mu one equals mu two. So our alternative might be mu one is less than mu two or mu one is bigger than mu two. But remember that equality is always included in the null case. Okay, so we have test statistic. So uh, we're getting more used to the structure of these. In the last section, we had one involving proportions. This one's about means. Uh, but it still has, uh, it's a fraction. 
This time it's t. I said we're going to be using the t statistic because uh, we don't know the sigma one and sigma two. We'll be using t. Uh, it's a fraction. In the numerator, we have a difference, just as we did um, earlier. Uh, we have basically x bar minus mu uh, for just the regular kind of t statistic. The difference between the sample mean and the hypothesized population mean. Uh, over here, it's a difference of two differences, though. So in the first part of the subtraction, we have the difference of the x bars. So x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus the claimed difference. And since our null hypothesis is that the two means are equal, this part ends up being 0 uh, virtually always. And it'll be always for our examples. OK? So mu1 minus mu2 is assumed to be 0. And we're basically checking if the difference between x bar 1 and x bar 2 uh, if that is uh, significantly different from zero. Okay, down below we have a little statement involving the standard deviations. It uh, bears kind of a resemblance to the one involving uh, proportions, but also kind of resembles the one from our t-statistic uh, from before. So s over root n before, but now we have two samples. And so we have the square root of uh, s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. All right, so there's that. I would write it down and keep that somewhere handy as we proceed. Okay, as you know, when you're working with the t-table, you need to have a degrees of freedom. And when we were doing uh, t's before, it was uh, always n minus one, right? So here we have two different n's, so we have to see how to handle that. Okay, when finding critical values or p-values, we're going to use the following for determining the number of degrees of freedom denoted by df. Okay, um, there's two methods that we can use for figure out the degrees of freedom. The conclusion of a hypothesis is uh, not affected very often by different choices of the degrees of freedom. We might get different numbers for the P or for the test statistic, but the overall conclusion as far as to reject or fail to reject is going to be the same virtually always. Okay, so in this book, in this example, and in our homework, um, the degrees of freedom will be the smaller of one less than the sample size. So you take a look at n1, you take a look at n2, which one's smaller, and then take away one. Okay, that's what we'll use when we're looking at values in the t-table. Okay, um, if you're going to be doing this on the computer, um, there's more complicated formulas the computer probably uses. They give a little bit better values, but are too cumbersome for us to do uh, by hand, really. Uh, so that's this. So you can read this in this green box down below and uh, try it if you want. But basically, there's a more common, a complicated formula for calculating uh, degrees of freedom here. Like I said, we're not going to use that one. We're just going to take the smaller of uh, one less than um, two sample sizes. Okay. You can get uh, p-values uh, provided by technology. We can approximate them from our t-table if we wish. Okay, so let's see about trying an example. Okay, so uh, that is here, just repeated for our reference. And so uh, here is the story. We want to compare the mean cholesterol content of grilled chicken sandwiches from Arby's and McDonald's. So we're going to randomly select several sandwiches from each restaurant and measure their cholesterol content. And then uh, the results are shown in uh, the table below. We're going to test the claim that the cholesterol content is different in the two types of sandwiches. We're going to use an alpha of 0 0.10. So um, it says different. The uh, claim is that the cholesterol content is different. Different just sounds like not equal to me. So our null hypothesis is that the two means are equal. Our alternative hypothesis is that they're not equal to each other. Okay, so we want to test that claim. Okay, so here it doesn't look like it. They're both about 60 and 61 milligrams of cholesterol. And then um, I need a standard deviation. I'll have to put that in. Um, it doesn't look like it, but we ha will uh, have to check and then make sure. So let me go get the uh, value for that standard deviation, which I've misplaced. All right, so I got the table fixed now. So um, 
picture is a good idea. So our test is two tailed. And we want an alpha of 0 0.10. Since we've got an alpha of 0 0.10 and the test is two tailed, that means we need 0 0.05 in either tail. Okay, so then uh, we need to figure out what our um, critical values are, which we will get from our t-table. So to do that, we need to know our degrees of freedom. So sample size, uh, 15 and 12. Which one's smaller? 12. Now take away one. So the degrees of freedom is going to be 11. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, we need to get our critical value off the t table. So let's grab that. All right. So here's a look at our uh, t table. We have a degrees of freedom of 11. So we're going to our t table. Degrees of freedom is 11 here. And then our picture has 0 0.10 in the two tails or 0 0.05 in each tail. So we'll go to the column. This is area in one tail is 0.05, or area in two tails is 0.10. And go and see where those intersect. And that looks like 1.796. So that will be our two critical values at positive 1.796 and negative 1.796. OK, so now we've got the uh, critical values. So what we're going to want to do next is uh, get the test statistic, and that'll be the part that uh, takes us the most time. So let me make a little space. And now uh, here's all of the numbers we need. So uh, test statistic, let me go ahead and write this down for us. Sorry, that's kind of not that interesting. OK, all right, so let's plug in the values that we have. So we have the difference of the two means. That's 61 minus 60. And then our hypothesized mean uh, difference of means is 0, right? Remember, our null hypothesis is uh, that mu1 equals mu2. So if mu1 equals mu2, then their difference is going to be 0. OK, and then down below, we have the square root S1 squared, um, that's 3.59 squared. And their sample size is 15. Remember, by the way, to use uh, the sample size uh, itself. And don't take away one on this. We just take away one when we're figuring out the degrees of freedom. OK, and then we'll have 2.41 squared over 12. OK, so let me calculate this. Get us a decimal. All right. So I got a test statistic of 0.862 right here. And so where that would fall is higher than the mean, but not far enough into the right tail to be in the rejection region. So based on this, we'll fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. There's not enough evidence to support the claim that the means, uh, mean cholesterol levels are different. OK, so we did this, by the way, using a critical value method. I did want to point out that if we were going to try to figure out the p-value for this, if we're just using a table, uh, we would necessarily need to estimate it. So let's think about how we would do that, just for practice. So our critical value ended at 0.862. So let's go back to our t table for a minute. So in the row uh, 11, where our degrees of freedom is, there isn't a value for 0.862. The lowest it goes is 1.363. If we had a more full table that included our 0.862, then these are all in order, right? 3.1, 2.7, 2.2, 1.7, 1.796, 1.363. The next column, let's say we had a column that had 0.862 in it, it would be over here, OK? It would be over here. And so think about what would need to be the area in two tails. The area in two tails, notice these are going up, 0.01, 0.02, 0.05, 0.10, 0.20. 
Here, this would have to be bigger than 0 0.20. So our p-value for this one is bigger than 0 0.20. Okay, so that's how this would look uh, with a uh, p-value type approach. All right, in the next example, we're going to look at how to construct a confidence interval for the difference between two means. So uh, here's our formula we're going to follow. Again, we're going to have a margin of error E. This time it is T alpha over two, because again, we don't know our population standard deviations. And then the part underneath the root sign is the same as the part underneath the root in our test statistic uh, that we had a minute ago. S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. That's the part underneath the square root. So to construct the confidence interval, we take the difference of the sample means and then either subtract or add uh, the E to come up with the left end and right end of that interval. As before, we're going to get our, our values out of the T table. We use the degrees of freedom that is the lesser of uh, N min N1 minus one or N2 minus one. All right, so the story that we're gonna go with here is uh, do men talk less than women? Uh, the accompanying table uh, gives results from a study of the words spoken in a day by men and women. The original data are in the book. Um, there's a source that is given. We're to find a 95% confidence interval for the difference in mean number of words spoken uh, in a day. Okay, so uh, let's start by coming up with E. And then uh, to do that, we're going to need our T alpha over two. So uh, let's think about that. So I like to make a picture. Okay, we want to make a 95% confidence interval. So that means that in the two tails, we would need 5%. And so each tail is 2.5%. OK, and then um, for our, our uh, t alpha over 2, our critical value, we're going to need our degrees of freedom. So for this one, they're big samples, 186 and 210. The smaller of the two is 186, and one less than that is 185. So let's grab our t table and see what we can figure out for our critical value. All right, so our degrees of freedom was 185. And if you go towards the higher end of the t table, you see that there's not, of course, rows for every possible degrees of freedom. Towards the higher end of my table, there's a row for 100 and then 200. The closer one is 200, so I think I'm gonna use that, especially because if we go with a bigger value, then that will give us a uh, wider margin of error. Actually, it's in the denominator, so um, smaller margin of error. So um, they're pretty close to each other though. We have 1.964 and 1.972. So you'll see people use either one or the other of the two values. We could take the mean of the two. Just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to take the 1.972 and use that. If you like, um, 1.964. If you like, you could recalculate this with the other one and uh, see how much or maybe how little that affects your results. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is get our test, uh, not our test statistic, we're doing confidence interval. Uh, we need to construct the rest of our E. So let's do that next. All right, so I've calculated the margin of error. So I've repeated the formula here for your reference. I substituted in the T alpha over two of 1.972 corresponding to row 200 in our table. And then the values uh, uh, copied over from this table on our right came out with a margin of error of 2,535. So we're going to take that and uh, add and subtract that uh, to and from the difference of the two means, uh, the two sample means, of course. So let's go ahead and get the difference of the two sample means. And that's, um, make sure I typed right. 546.5. Let me subtract. Um, we're going to do x1 minus x2. So that will be negative 546.5. Okay. And then we're going to add and subtract um, our 2535.1 from that. So.
Okay, so let's see what we get. So we have negative 3,081.6. And then 1,988.6 on the other side. All right, so there is our confidence interval for the difference in the mean number of words spoken by men and women. Um, the intervals uh, contain zero and it extends like 3,000 into negative numbers and almost 2,000 into positive numbers. So I don't, I wouldn't be convinced that this value is either positive or negative specifically. So if we wanted to use the confidence interval to try to make a hypothesis test, um, I don't think there would be information to support uh, a claim that there is a uh, difference in the two means. By the way, I also recalculated the uh, margin of error if we had used uh, the row for 100 instead, which had 1.964 in it. If you do that, you get a margin of error of 2,525 instead of 2,535, which is a difference of only 10 words. So um, that's not going to make a meaningful difference uh, here in our confidence interval, I don't think. Okay, so that takes us to the end of that example. And uh, that will also take us to the end of this video. In our next part, uh, we'll go ahead and do a couple more examples. Okay, in the meantime, let me know if you have any questions and then have a great day.